uh, I too, of course, start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Dawa Nguna, Dawa Ngunnawal, Yangu Gulanin, Nalawiri Dunai, Ngunnawal Dawa, Wangara Lidinin, Marin Balan Bugaran. It's a great pleasure to be here today and I want to thank Steve very much indeed for inviting me to participate. I want to also acknowledge the value of ABEARS, the value of the work that it does and of this valuable conference. And having a very, very long time ago been a student of economics, I've always had a huge respect for ABEARS. I've often picked up your publications and I'm delighted to be here today at what I think we all agree, it seems to be a theme has started and, and uh, I too will speak to it. Uh, there are difficult times out there, not just at home, but internationally. But ABEAR's Outlook Conference is of course a time-honoured affair and, and that's for good reason. It's the perfect encapsulation of your mission to deliver high quality insight and analysis of Australia's primary industries to both government and business. Of course, this work underpins the well-being and prosperity of Australia's regions and industries and positions us to better adapt to emerging challenges and opportunities. I'm struck by how ABEAR's history is intertwined with Australia's evolution as a trading nation. ABEAR's was established in 1949 as the Bureau of Agricultural Economics. It fo its focus at that time was to understand the economic structure and performance of Australia's primary industries. In 1946, Prime Minister Chifley said, and I quote, the agricultural prosperity of Australia depends upon the widening of world trade, end quote. In 1967, the Australian government equipped itself to better understand the implications of that insight when Cabinet expanded the Bureau's role to include policy analysis and forecasting. Agricultural economics played a leading role in the policy revolution of the 1980s, when our nation achieved a lasting consensus that to prosper, we must embrace international markets, not to protect ourselves from them. And it was the 1980s, 1985 in fact, that I joined the then Department of Foreign Affairs as a, as a graduate with an economics degree, and later, uh, the year after, headed off to Hong Kong uh, to help us understand this emerging market opening and reform unleashed by Deng Xiaoping a few years earlier. And I did that uh, from the vantage point of Hong Kong down at the Bureau of uh, Census and Statistics, uh, flicking through their data. I well understand the importance of data. I regret slightly that my career has taken me in other paths since, but I want you to understand, Steve, what you had to say about forecasting, what you had to say about data, and I know what you're going to be talking about during the conference, obviously, I fully support. If we fast forward to today, Australia's effective use of trade policy has been essential to our economic growth and competitiveness in primary industries and across the board. I'm pleased to be here this morning because this is a group, you are a group, that continues to lead thinking on trade and investment for Australia's ongoing prosperity. And we need that kind of thinking today. The international trading arrangements that have served us well are under pressure. Under the Trump administration, the United States is seeking to change the nature of some of its trading relationships. The foreign minister recently noted in Washington that we have publicly and privately acknowledged the concerns of the US and others about some trade and investment practices, including concerns about the protection of intellectual property and the rules governing the involvement of government entities in markets. These issues need to be resolved, but in our view, no one wins from a trade war. The outlook for Australian and global growth has been downgraded slightly due in part to the current trade tensions. Our agricultural exporters are watching closely as new trade policies are affecting major markets in the United States, Europe, China and Japan. Trade policy is becoming more complex and more contested than in decades. We need to work together, pooling expertise across government and business to stay ahead of the game. We have an enormous advantage, a consensus that open trade and investment settings with effective safety nets 
has led to prosperity. This is also the formula for our future prosperity. Having completed 27 consecutive years of economic growth, we stand tall as the 13th largest global economy, despite, having only, despite ranking only 53rd by population. Australian goods and services are in high demand around the world, supported by confidence in our strong economic and trading reputation and high quality products. We remain an attractive investment destination. Today, there is more than $3 trillion of foreign investment in Australia, and foreign-owned companies employ around 1 million Australians. The government noted in the 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper that the, the dynamic changes underway in our region will continue to drive our economy and offer Australia significant opportunities. Asia overall stands to deliver nearly two-thirds of global growth to 2030. By that time, the region will produce more than half of the world's economic output and consume more than half of the world's food and 40% of its energy. Australia's economy will continue to complement those of growing Asia. Demand from Asia for our premium agricultural products will be strong. Over the next decade, well over a billion more Asians will join the middle class, creating a consumer market larger in number and spending power than the rest of the world combined. Their choices will reshape global markets. Australia's reputation as a provider of green, clean, safe and high quality produce stands our exporters in good stead to capitalise on this phenomenon. We want to stay well positioned in an Indo-Pacific region that remains open to international trade. So the vital question is, how do we exert maximum influence towards openness and growth? The World Trade Organization has underpinned sustained global economic growth through its framework of trade rules, and it provides a systemic process to settle disputes if our trading partners breach those rules. I've established in DFAT a new branch in the Office of Trade Negotiations, in part to strengthen our capacity to support Australian industry to take disputes to the WTO and deliver practical commercial outcomes. We know that's what you want. We have a strong case, for example, that a range of Canadian measures negatively impact our access to our fourth largest export market for wine, valued at nearly $200 million. We hope to have these restrictions removed through the independent adjudication of the WTO. We all recognise that the WTO is not perfect. There are some substantial weaknesses in, it, in its system, but a system of no rules no transparency is no system at all. Australia will do all we can to sustain the multilateral trading system. We think the best way to strengthen the WTO is to use it well. We believe countries should pursue their trade grievances in ways that strengthen the rules-based character of the world trading system. It's encouraging to see the United States doing just this. Last week, a WTO dispute settlement panel found in favour of the United States that China had provided farm subsidies for wheat and rice well in excess of its WTO commitments. Although subject to appeal, China is now required to bring its subsidies into compliance with WTO rules. Similarly, last week Australia formally requested WTO dispute consultations with India over the high level of subsidies they pay to their sugar industry. These subsidies have encouraged massive overproduction in India, contributing to a glut in the global sugar market and badly impacting the world sugar price. We, along with Brazil, believe these subsidies breach India's WTO commitments and have commenced a WTO dispute to prove it. The point is that the WTO dispute settle settlement system, although under strain, still functions and we all need to continue to back it which is why we're working with several nations to improve the WTO's ability to handle major challenges. We're pushing for global agricultural reforms and to address trade distorting agricultural subsidies. We're helping to drive the ongoing fisheries subsidies negotiations. 
We're also leading the move to WTO e-commerce negotiations, which will create new international digital trade rules to make it easier for Australian exporters, including in agriculture, to access new markets and operate across borders. The government has pursued a deliberate strategy to build on WTO rules and to continue to open new markets through an ambitious free trade agreement agenda. Five years ago, FTAs covered around a quarter of Australia's trade, 26%. Once we've concluded negotiations currently underway, more than 90% will be covered by free trade rules and commitments. Many of you will have seen the news yesterday that Simon Birmingham and his Indonesian counterpart, Engai Lukita, signed the Indonesia-Australia Free Trade Agreement, a cause for much celebration, including amongst my long, uh, long suffering, I think I can say that, can't I? Trade negotiators, some of whom who had been at this for seven years. But it's a landmark agreement with a close and important neighbour that will have real benefits for Australia's agricultural producers. There are big wins for cattle, dairy, grains, and many other areas. Now the agreement is signed, both sides will work on domestic ratification so we can have it enter into force as soon as possible. We saw it with our three North Asian FTAs, with China, Japan, and the Republic of Korea, that business can boom where tariffs are lowered. The 11 country Trans-Pacific Partnership will further strengthen access for Australian farmers and agribusiness into markets comprising almost half a billion people. We're continuing to work to open up new opportunities for Australian business. We're committed to concluding negotiations this year for a high quality and mutually beneficial Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, which covers 16 Indo-Pacific countries, including 10 of Australia's top trading partners. We're pursuing an ambitious and comprehensive FTA with the European Union. The EU as a bloc is Australia's second largest trading partner, and an FTA will help to usher in a new era of Australia-EU trade relations. I know there are some complex issues that we're going to have to work through uh, before we can do that, but it will bring considerable benefits. We're also prepared to negotiate with the UK on a UK-Australia FTA when the time is right. A little hard actually to know precisely when that will be. The UK is second only to the US as an investment partner to Australia and is our seventh largest trading partner. The potential of our FTAs is evident in the story of Brook Farm, a family-run farm in Byron Bay. 30 years ago, Pam and Martin Brook bought an old rundown dairy farm. With hard work, some good advice and a passion for macadamias, they transformed that dairy farm into a thriving food forest. Brook Farm not only now produces macadamias, but has set up a local factory and bakehouse. It's making a difference in the community. It's also making the most of international opportunities. Starting off small, exporting to New Zealand, Brook Farm has expanded its exports to the United States, then China, and then Japan, with the list going on. As of January this year, under the FTA with China, Brook Farm's exports to China are completely tariff-free. Under the TPP-11, Brook Farm can export their goods to new markets, including Canada and Mexico, far more cheaply. Like many other businesses, Brook Farm sees Europe as its next untapped market. Looking ahead, my department is increasingly focused on review and implementation of our existing FTAs. While it may not be as exciting as announcing a new FTA, our aim is to ensure that the agreements Australia has concluded are delivering for Australian businesses. Where agreements have been overtaken by more modern rules, we will look to update them. Where our market access into foreign markets has been overtaken, we will seek to improve it. Our agreements are not set and forget. They're living agreements that should evolve in light of emerging trends and to ensure Australia continues to receive the best treatment from our FTA partners. The economic dynamism of the Indo-Pacific is creating new trade and investment opportunities for Australian agriculture beyond our traditional trading partners. India remains the world's largest democracy 
and is now the world's fastest growing major economy. Today, India is Australia's fifth largest trading partner. But India still represents less than 4% of our global trade. As Simon Birmingham said in Sydney last November, India's burgeoning middle class is transforming its economy. India offers Australian business more potential growth opportunities over the next two decades than any other single market. Now, I'm not going to pretend that it's going to be easy, but the opportunities are there. Central to that growth being realised is the continuing opening and reform of India's economy, which we're encouraging, including through the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. There is a great deal that we can do to increase economic relations with India outside of formal trade negotiations. Recognising this, the Australian Government commissioned the India Economic Strategy, authored by my predecessor, Peter Varghese. The report identifies opportunities across 10 sectors and 10 Indian states. To take one example, on agribusiness, India's food demand is set to outplace supply. The strategy sets out a vision for an agribusiness partnership in which Australia has expanded our commodity exports and become a leading provider of professional agricultural services to India. Moving closer to home, the government is committed to taking our partnership with the Pacific to a new level. The Pacific is our part of the world. As the Prime Minister said, we're connected as members of a Pacific family. Our stability and prosperity are interlinked. Under the new Pacific Labor Scheme, the government has expanded opportunities for Pacific workers to help meet demand in rural and regional Australia. It will help fill labor gaps in Australia's towns and on our farms, boosting economic activity and competitiveness through a ready pool of workers. Although the scheme is only seven months old and is still, is, is still being ramped up, there are indications that Australian companies are benefiting. The number of approved employers under the scheme is growing each month, creating increased demand. One of our first employers under the Pacific Labor Scheme, Mulfer Australia, had high staff turnover in excess of 160% at its remote Hayman Island resort in Queensland. But the scheme has given Mulfer Australia a reliable stream of suitable workers and helped the company reduce its human, reduce, reduce its human resource costs. More for Australia's experience has been so positive that it's our biggest employer under the scheme and now employs nearly one third of its workers through the program. There are exciting new opportunities to pursue over the next five to 10 years. New and emerging forms of trade and economic activity will continue to evolve and develop in the years to come. Technology is, is relentless. It's revolutionising economic development in areas such as farming, health, communications and finance. On the upside, technology is helping to connect populations to the global economy. So Australia is well placed to position itself to make the most of these opportunities. The digital economy provides great opportunities for not just the big players, but also for smaller businesses to connect with their export markets. Digital platforms will make it easier to do business across borders, providing businesses with global reach to a huge potential customer base. New technologies and increased connectivity can help release untapped potential in the agricultural sector. Technologies can help boost farm productivity, such as through smarter irrigation systems that improve yields, wearable technology to better monitor livestock, health and performance, and renewable energy gains helping lower the costs of farming. But we also need to be clear-eyed about the fact that technological change will bring challenges. Global production chains may shift, automation will affect how we work, and digital platforms can change who we trade with. So the government is working to position ourselves to be at the forefront of developing rules and norms around the digital economy. And while technology will connect people to the global economy, fears about the impact of technology on society and jobs may feed resistance to technological advances and intensify misgivings about trade and globalisation. Governments in our region will need to consider policies that strengthen economic resilience and competitiveness to enable communities and businesses to harness innovation and embrace technology as a driver of growth. 
That's why the Australian government is working to help communities both at home and overseas adapt to the future of work by supporting an open digital framework, building digital capabilities of small businesses and bridging the gender digital divide. Let me conclude with the observation that we need to embrace the future head on. To do this, we must be strategic and coordinated, both at home and internationally. DFAT is ramping up our support for Australian companies doing business overseas to promote investment, address non-tariff barriers to trade, and support businesses seeking new commercial opportunities. But business also has an important part to play. Australia's diplomacy is most effective when government and business partner together to support our international economic and commercial interests. We need your ideas about how we can best prosecute Australia's interests internationally. As protectionist sentiment rises around the world, government and business need to work together to make the case to the public for trade and investment. We in government need your support. The stakes are high and small steps taken in the right spirit can make a difference. So thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today and I wish you a productive and enjoyable conference.